back, everybody. Uh, one of the things I'm very conscious of when I write these lectures is how uh, deeply untranslatable uh, the mathematics are, uh, in the sense that uh, I have to do the lectures using natural human language, uh, but the machine underneath this stuff that's processing the inferences is a logical <laughs> robot, a golem in the, in the metaphor of this course. And so I do my best to try and find metaphors that honestly communicate uh, how those things operate, but there's always a struggle. Uh, and so um, a lot of what we'll do in uh, the lecture today and in the weeks to come is try to find satisfactory ways uh, to do that translation, to, to, to give you intuitions about how the machine operates. Um, but the risk, of course, is that I'm using these words which reference things that you experience in your everyday life, like information. Or I don't know, does anyone experience information? It's just a word we use. I'm not sure what it means. But anyway, you have to use words that you do use occasionally uh, in your everyday life. But their meaning is very particular to the examples. Uh, so I just tell you this to make you nervous, I guess, <laughs> because that's my job. Uh, but uh, so uh, with that warning on the label, <laughs> uh, let's, let's keep going. So when you were last here on Wednesday, we had arrived at this point in our drama. Let me recap what this is about, and then we'll pick up speed from here. So uh, basic threat in, in um, applied statistical modeling, perhaps the primary threat is overfitting that uh, as we add complexity to models, they tend to fit the sample better and better, but they often, not always, but often make worse predictions out of sample. And there will be some sweet spot, is the assertion, <laughs> of complexity, which captures the so-called regular features of the process that's generating the data. And that's our goal as scientists. Uh, or even if you're not a scientist, you're a marketer who works for Netflix and you want to predict people's program choices. Um, so here's the example. This is simulated data to show you, in theory, what this problem is like. Uh, on the vertical axis, we have the deviance, which is, uh, to remind you, an estimate of the relative divergence uh, from the target. Uh, you can compare different models fit to the same data sets with metrics like deviance. Um, on the horizontal, we have different models of different complexity. Here in these simple linear regressions, complexity is merely measured by the number of parameters. It'll get more complicated later on. Uh, and then the blue points and um, bars represent 10,000 simulations where we have generated some data from a known process, which has three parameters generating it. Uh, and uh, the build point marks the in-sample deviance. So this is a measure of the fit. This is uh, proportional to R squared, if you were, if you're accustomed to using R squared. And then the bars are the standard deviations of the distribution of the, of the deviance across the simulations. And then the open circles in black and the standard deviation bars are out of sample. Uh, notice every model, uh, looking on the left now, where it's 20 data points in the training and prediction samples, um, every model does worse out of sample. Not too surprising, right? Uh, there are things, every model learns too much about the particular sample, and so it does better in sample than out of sample. It's very hard to find statistical machinery that doesn't work that way. And, uh, but uh, the pattern in sample and out of sample is radically different, and that's what I want you to see, is that um, in sample, uh, it just keeps going down. Now remember, deviance, deviance is a measure of the badness uh, that's to quote Akaike, who's the founder of this uh, field, this kind of measure. Actually, Akaike called AIC a measure of the badness of a model. Why is it badness? Because when it's big, it's bad, right? It doesn't, it, models get worse the bigger the deviance is, because it's divergence from the target. You want it to be small, not big. So it's a measure of badness. So uh, notice the blue points keep going down. The fit keeps getting better the more complex you make the model. Uh, but out of sample, it's definitely not like that. Uh, it gets uh, worse initially uh, when we add a second parameter, but then it gets better when we add three. Why? Because that's the actual data generating process. Uh, that's why. Uh, and then it progressively gets worse again as you add additional redundant parameters that aren't actually um, reflecting any of the regular features of the data generating process. Does this make sense? Yeah? Uh, 
When I first learned about this uh, in graduate school, I felt deeply betrayed by my undergraduate education. <laughs> that I had learned a bunch of statistics and no one had ever told me that this would happen. So I hope to communicate that sense of betrayal to you uh, as well, and then we will try to address uh, uh, issues about it. So uh, on the right, same thing, but now with larger samples to train and test. Uh, so uh, I want you to notice that uh, the initial improvement in the blue points on the right is dramatically better. When we drop the three, the drop, the fit in sample is dramatically improved. We've got a lot more data to train things on. Your statistical machine, your little linear regression golem can do a lot better uh, discovering what's going on. There's more evidence, so not, not too surprising. But it's still true that models four and five are slightly, Im almost imperceptibly, better than model three. That's because linear regression fits. Uh, that's its job. And then we have the same a general pattern in the out of sample, but it's much dampened. Uh, uh, that is, um, the, uh, three is still the best, uh, four and five are slightly worse, but the differences aren't as big. Uh, and one of the reasons for this, and this will be important as we go forward, is four and five are worse, but since there's more data, the coefficient estimates for the redundant parameters are really close to zero. So four and five aren't that much worse because there's enough data to coach them so that they don't do bad jobs even though they have redundant parameters. Does that make some sense? Uh, okay, so one way to deal with this, or rather this problem of overfitting, uh, we need some kind of uh, way to cope with it, to make models less excitable. Uh, and any particular model, because even if you had model three there, you knew that was the structurally correct model, you've still got to get the right parameter estimates for it. And so it will overfit even by itself, right? <laughs> uh, you, you've got to get the right uh, uh, effect sizes. So uh, uh, statisticians have developed a large number of different procedures for doing what's called regularization, because uh, this is about finding the regular features of a sample. Um, and uh, I'm a big fan of regularization partly because it, it casts aside this sort of traditional fight between Bayesian and non-Bayesian statisticians, which is mainly a, a debate of only academic interest. Uh, and it focuses in our, in our attention instead on some practical issue that's important to scientists and not career statisticians, uh, fightings within their tribes. Uh, and that is, how do you uh, recover the regular features of your sample, regardless of what framework you're working in? So, I, I'm well known for this attitude that I don't care if people use Bayesian procedures or not. What I care is that people regularize. If you're not regularizing, then you're doing a worse job than you could. Uh, everybody overfits. I don't care what paradigm you use. This is not only a feature of Bayesian systems. It's a feature of non-Bayesian ones as well. And that's why every statistical tradition has uh, strategies for regularization. And it turns out that in the Bayesian approach, Priors are an extremely convenient and obvious and documentable way to conduct regularization. If they did not exist, you would need to invent them. Uh, and I, this is important to note because often uh, if you encounter Bayesian statistics after you've encountered non-Bayesian statistics, uh, Bayesian statistics are sometimes taught as, well, we take all that old stuff and then we add priors. Uh, that is fundamentally not correct. <laughs> that is not what Bayesian statistics is. Uh, but when you get that lesson, it seems like priors are just this onerous thing, like, oh my God, now I need to choose a prior. It's like, well, congratulations, you get to choose a prior. <laughs> and by getting to choose a prior, you get to regularize your model. That's what it's for. Uh, anyway, sorry, sermon. Uh, there will be more uh, sermons of this type. But no, it's, it's, priors are like uh, uh, seat belts. Uh, most of the time, you don't need them. <laughs> uh, I mean, really, you don't. Most trips, you don't wear your seat belt, you'll be fine, because most trips, you don't crash. Uh, like bicycle helmets, same thing. Most of the time, you don't need them. But when you do need them, boy, you're glad you have them. Yeah, it's a bit onerous. Oh, man, I had to put on my seatbelt this morning. Uh, that really sucks compared to those uh, non-Bayesian cars that don't require seatbelts. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes you really need the seatbelt. No, the non-Bayesian cars have other safety devices, right? Uh, you need penalized likelihood or some, or some sort of regression tree approach or something like that. But there are, they're all forms of seatbelts that guard against overfitting. Okay, so um, this is why I've been against flat priors since day one in this course is because flat priors overfit. They let the likelihood drive, and if you let the likelihood drive, well, it will overfit. Uh, so you want to tame it a bit. And uh, you don't have to put too much information in the prior to help regularization. Um, it's easy to do better than flat, right? So 
Uh, we want to use informative conservative priors to reduce overfitting. And this basically it, it puts a little bit of information in the model before it sees the data. And that information takes the form of uh, infinite estimates are impossible. <laughs> That's kind of the minimum informative prior. And then you can do a little better than that. If you have some domain knowledge, you can tighten it uh, to a more optimal uh, level. Often people will choose priors in data science through cross-validation. Uh, you can choose the prior over time if you get enough experience in the domain. Uh, but anything better than flat is, is good. Uh, obviously, there is risk if you make it too informative. You won't learn enough from the data. In my experience, this is not the risk, but it is a possible risk, so you should be aware of it. Uh, so I'm going to call these regularizing priors. That's a standard uh, language. And these normal 0, 1 priors that I've been putting on slopes are an example of this. That's, there's very little information in that prior. You can think of it as being proportional to having observed one data point with a value of 0 uh, prior to seeing the sample. Uh, that'll give you a, a posterior distribution that is normal 0, 1. Uh, you can overwhelm that very, very quickly, but it means that infinite effects are impossible. And so the model is skeptical of really big effect sizes uh, with small samples. If your sample's large, you'll completely overwhelm this and you're fine. But, uh, so this is a regularizing prior. Uh, there are lots of regularizing strategies um, uh, in the literature, and, and I may have opportunity to show you some fancier ones later in the course. Okay, uh, let's see what these priors do. Let me show you visually the effect of putting a little bit of skepticism in your golem. Uh, same scenario as before, this is all synthetic data, uh, deviance on the vertical, the same set of models on the horizontal here. Model three is still the data generating process. Um, 20 data points, and what I want to show you is the effects of using three different regularizing priors on all five of these models. Uh, so now we have uh, 15 models, right? There's three versions of each. Um, we'll take them one set at a time. What are the priors? Uh, uh, we have three different uh, Gaussian priors with different standard deviations. The first is the normal zero one. Right, which is the dashed line on the far right here. Uh, normal uh, 0, 1 half, uh, which is the slightly more peaked one, and then a normal uh, 0, 0.2, which is even more peaked. So the 0, 1 is the least skeptical of big effects and then progressively towards the others. And so let me show you what happens in sample first and then out of sample. So in sample, this always reduces your fit. Because right, you're adding information. This is like synthetic data from the model's perspective. Uh, priors are like previous learning from data from the model's perspective. And so it fits the sample less. And then what we see is the dashed line on the left is the 0, 1 model. The uh, uh, thin solid line is the 0, 1 half model. And the thick solid line is the 0, 0.2 model. And you'll notice that they get progressively worse right, across all model types. Yeah, on average. And that's because priors reduce your fit. Is this bad though? No, because what this buys us is better out of sample performance. The relationship is exactly reversed out of sample. Now out of sample, you just mirror image those things, right? Now we've still got that zigzag pattern where um, it gets worse at first and then model three gets better because model three is the data generating model. And then four and five are even worse. Uh, but notice now the thick black line, which is the tightest regularizing prior, is at the bottom. It has the lowest deviance on average. It's better at predicting new data because it was less excited by the vagaries of your tiny 20 data points in your treatment, right? Uh, social psychologists in the room may be sensitive to this example, <laughs> right? Uh, that's why you're here is to learn about this. Uh, and then uh, uh, the thin uh, solid line above that, uh, and then the uh, dashed line, the zero one, um, and the points being what we had before on the previous slides where the priors are essentially flat. Um, you get the points that, up there. Does this make sense? Yeah? So your fit will get worse, uh, but your prediction, your expected prediction gets better. Uh, and that's why we want to use uh, regularizing priors. So again, I, don't, I, don't, I honestly don't care if people use Bayesian inference or not. It's, it's convenient for me uh, because it, solves, it makes an easy way to solve lots of problems, but um, what I do care is that people are worried about overfitting and regularize somehow. Uh, same example, uh, now with a big sample in of 100, uh, same relationships, but the, the effect is much dampened because you have a lot more data. So with a lot of data, you overwhelm all the priors. Priors don't matter as much, at least in models like this. 
Uh, there are types of bottles we'll see later in the course where as your sample size increases, the, the priors may never wash out. Um, so uh, uh, the lesson I want you to get from this is these regularizing priors are going to hurt any measure of fit to sample. So you can't compare models to one another by their fit to sample. That ignores the overfitting problem and it actually penalizes models that are skeptical and those are the models that are going to make even better predictions uh, in many situations out of sample. So we need something else. Uh, is there a way that we could um, measure the expected out of sample? Because remember, in, in most cases, all we've got is the blue lines in most of our research. Right? You don't have the data generating process. That's imaginary, and you're just using some set of expectations. It'd be nice if there were a way to estimate a model's performance out of sample. And that's what Akaike's innovation is about, uh, this class of criteria called information criteria. This isn't the only way to do this calibration. There are other ways, uh, but this is an increasingly common way, um, and it has a deep relationship to Bayesian inference and to cross-validation. So uh, I think what perhaps the most appealing way to do this is if we really do have enough data that we can cross-validate. That's a great way to test these things, and then you can tune your priors and, and uh, uh, report that to your peers uh, 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 with maximum honesty. Uh, but often we don't have enough data to do cross-validation, and so there's the poor man's cross-validation, which is information criteria, which aims to estimate cross-validation performance. Um, information, because it's based on information theory, uh, uses this measure deviance or, or a Bayesian version of deviance, which is averaged over the posterior distribution. That's what we're going to end up using. Um, uh, and uh, it's a criterion because we're going to compare models based upon it. And there's a big family of these now, and what they all do is estimate, attempt to estimate the same thing, the relative out of sample error. Again, remember the badness in Akaike's uh, language of it, the badness of your model, relative badness. There's no absolute badness. Um, and so uh, AIC was only the first of these. Um, there's also uh, uh, the so-called Akaike information criterion. There's also DIC, the deviance information criterion, and uh, now, WAIC, which is what we're going to use, uh, the widely applicable uh, information criterion. Um, and uh, there's some new ones. There's a new really good one, which I won't lecture on, uh, uh, which is a, a Pareto smoothed uh, leave one out cross-validation metric, um, which uh, is, looks a lot like WAIC. It performs a lot like it. And my package will calculate it for you, but I, I, I apologize it's not in the lecture today. BIC? Hmm? BIC? BIC is not an information criterion. Okay. So the question was, what about BIC? BIC, despite the fact that it's called Bayesian information criterion, is neither Bayesian nor an information criterion. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I won't go into that, but it's horrible. It, it's horrible. <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, it, it, it relates to another way of comparing models, which is not necessarily horrible, but BIC as an exemplar is. <laughs> That's what I, I should say this mature. There's a tiny box in my book about it. That's all I say about it. Um, I'm personally not a big fan of that way of doing things, but it's not silly. Uh, okay. Uh, let me give due credit to Akaike. Um, uh, so uh, his goal was to, uh, again, it's the same meta model of forecasting and the derivation of AIC, the, what we now call the Akaike information criterion, but he called an information criterion. Right? He didn't actually name it after himself. Um, is based on this same cross-validation metaphor. And then he does the analysis and calculates out the expected difference between in and out of sample performance uh, for a simple class of linear models is what this is for. So it's the same idea. We've got two samples, training and testing of size n. We fit a model to the training sample. We get the divergence, an estimate of the divergence per train. Uh, then we use that fit from training to compute the divergence out of sample. And that's difference is what we want a mathematical expression for. And he was able to derive this. Uh, and so under some fairly strict conditions, which I'll discuss, uh, uh, AIC, uh, which is an estimate of the out of sample divergence, which is the thing we want to compare models on, right? We'd like to choose our models based upon out of sample performance, is the in sample divergence plus two times the number of parameters, uh, which is just like too gorgeous to believe, right? <laughs> that it's actually this good. Uh, those of you who also do mathematical theory in the room, it isn't usually this nice, is it? Uh, it's usually a little bit messier than this. Um, and this is an approximation of the expected uh, divergence in the test sample. 
Uh, this is a true uh, statistical triumph, and it spawned a big literature of innovations. And I think we should regard, at this point in time, we should regard AIC as of historical interest. Uh, it it's, uh, only works for a very narrow range of perfectly linear models, and it spawned a lot more um, well-calibrated kinds of metrics of its type. And Akaike deserves all the credit for getting that ball rolling. Uh, but AIC is, like I said, it, it's of historical interest, really. Uh, so uh, why of historical interest? Well, um, it has a lot of conditions, and some of them have been superseded by more recent metrics, and some of them haven't. Uh, the first thing that hasn't been superseded is you have to like the AIC forecasting model. I'm going to have a little bit to say about this on the following slides. About it's Not all forecasting has this form of in and out of test, test in, uh, train in, test out. There are other things that we need to worry about sometimes. I'll give you some examples. Um, the other thing is flat priors. We don't want to use flat priors. AIC assumes flat priors. We, why don't you want flat priors? Because you want a seatbelt. Remember, <laughs> wear your seatbelts, people. Um, uh, it, it won't accommodate, as a symptom of this, it doesn't accommodate uh, varying or mixed or random effects, whatever you want to call hierarchical models, because uh, mixed effects models, by implication, have priors. That's why they're double level models, and so they have priors in them always. Uh, and uh, AIC also assumes the posterior distribution is multivariate Gaussian. Uh, we'd like metrics that extend beyond that, even though so far in the course we've been assuming that. Very soon we will be assuming much more interesting things. Um, and then finally, it requires that the number of parameters be much less than your sample size. Uh, as the number of param parameters approaches your sample size, you're going to infinitely overfit, right? <laughs> so that's, that's the thing we have to realize. Uh, so there is this AIC sub C, um, which tries to estimate that effect, this acceleration and overfitting as K approaches in, and I give you the expression for it here. Again, this is of historical interest. Uh, there are, you, if you use WAIC or the Pareto smooth leave one out cross validation, you'll you'll do much better than these formulas, uh, even for these, even for the simple models where these things are satisfied. Uh, so again, this is of historical interest, but all these metrics have been superseded uh, by cooler things that your computer will compute for you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let me. Um, talk about before we get to the uh, put this in action we'll spend the rest of the lecture showing you how to use these things um, let me talk about the forecasting task for a bit just to reemphasize that the, the synthetic data simulations I showed you assume that you get some sample of a fixed size and then you're going to have to predict using your training uh, estimates the out of sample not all learning in the world that we'd like to do as statisticians is like that uh, so let me give you a slightly humorous example that that is maybe uh, memorable. And then on the next slide, I'll give you a much less humorous example, which is equally memorable. So um, there are a lot of applied statistical problems in the world, um, which scientists need to do, decision makers need to do, and animals and plants need to do, which are not like this at all. They do not get a big batch of evidence, which they can then process in a cost-free way, <laughs> produce some inference, and then compare the different models, and then make a choice. Uh, if you're a squirrel and you're trying to decide how long to forage on a tree or how much of your attention to devote to predators versus eating, you don't get to learn that way. <laughs> you don't get a sample <laughs> and you get to test it out of sample. It doesn't work like that. It's a, literally a life or death <coughs> situation. Uh, so uh, those sorts of decision problems where you have to gather data as you learn, and so your, your data collection strategy is mixed in with your estimation strategy. Or, that's often called prequential analysis. All scientists do frequential analysis. It's what we do between papers, right? <laughs> Where you're deciding, deciding what kind of study you're going to do next. That's a form of frequential analysis. You've learned something, now you're going to collect some new data, but your data collection is guided by what you just learned. And that's how I posit the humble squirrel must learn. It's also uh, how I would like to figure out how to cook a worst. Uh, so there, there is a perennial debate in my house about the best way to cook a sausage. And um, at least I have a strong opinion about it. And uh, now let's say that there, there are two discrete options. Um, you can grill the sausage, just, just grill the sausage, as they would do nearby here in Thuringia. <laughs> just grill the sausage. Uh, or you could boil it uh, so that the inside gets cooked, and then you grill it on a really hot grill to make the outside crispy. And then you get that caduceus dam that makes it really good, right? <laughs> See, I have an opinion about that. This. But uh, so the problem, of course, is you don't want to do a controlled experiment because that's a lot of sausage, <laughs> uh, and you actually want to eat these sausages and you want to eat well as you go. 
So the, uh, to design this experiment and, and figure out the way to do the optimal learning, if you're not going to do you know, factorial <laughs> experiment with sausages, is actually a lot more complicated than this. And AIC doesn't clearly offer the right way to do it. And there are ways to do this. There's this whole literature on prequential experimental design, which is more appropriate to understanding, I think, how people and other animals learn in their daily lives. Um, okay. So, uh, a less silly example, which nevertheless has the same structure. Um, during World War II, uh, there was a lot of effort, Bayesian effort actually, put towards finding submarines, uh, particularly in, in the uh, Atlantic Ocean to the west of France, uh, the Bay of Biscayne. Uh, and uh, German U-boats were sinking a lot of ships, um, mainly uh, cargo ships. And obviously there was a lot of interest in stopping that, uh, but it's hard to find submarines. That's why submarines were built. <laughs> They're hard to find. This is a hard problem. So as you're searching the ocean, and as you search, you gain information about where there are not submarines or where there are submarines. And then the next place you search is guided by that. You don't get a sample of ocean plots and then you get to like test it on some other set. You're, there's a search going on and you don't get to design a factorial experiment around it. Uh, so there were Bayesian search strategies designed for this that were used to uh, find and sink uh, U-boats uh, during World War II. This is a famous example, I think. You'll find a lot about it online. Uh, okay, uh, AIC doesn't help you there. <laughs> you need something else, <laughs> right? Okay, back to our synthetic data thing. Here's what I want to show you. The triumph of Akaike is that his formula gives you a really great uh, estimate of the out-of-sample performance of the distance. So let me show you how this goes. Um, same thing as before. This is the 20 sample example. Blue points mean the same thing as before. That's the training performance in sample deviance. Open points, again, are out of sample deviance. Uh, and now I've drawn these line segments on here, which are the difference between the two in deviance units. And uh, what I want you to see is that uh, they tend to be around double the number of parameters. Not exactly, because again, AIC is just an estimate, and there's error on this. Uh, but uh, on average, it's about double the number of parameters for simple linear models with flat priors. Uh, that's how it works. And so uh, that's what you get. For the first model, the difference is two. There's one parameter. <laughs> the second model, it's just about four. Uh, the third model, it's a little less than six. It's, it's overperforming a little bit. Uh, uh, and then just about eight for the four-parameter model and just about ten. Uh, and this is the thing that Akagike computed is the expected uh, difference between in-sample and out-of-sample is twice the number of parameters. Um, it does pretty good. This is good enough for government work, right? <laughs> good enough for, for so, <laughs> And uh, uh, again, the, the metrics that have superseded AIC do an even better job uh, because their formulas don't expect exactly twice the number of parameters. So they'll do an even better job. Uh, but this is a, a, a tremendous triumph. But I want you to see, even though it doesn't get it exactly right, it gets the ordering right. It predicts that the third one's the best, uh, very slightly than the first one. Yeah, you see that? So this is the value of AIC, and its whole goal is to predict the cross-validation uh, performance, the test performance, so you can rank the models that way. Um, I still, every time I see these plots, like, it's just amazing, uh, right? And uh, Akaike has this uh, old uh, classic note where he's talking about how he discovered this, and he, he had been frustrated for weeks. He was trying to solve this problem, and then he, was, he sat down on a commuter train, and it all came to him like in a flash of light. <laughs> it's kind of a nice thought, right? So ride the train everybody. It's a good idea to come to you uh, on the train. Um, so uh, same thing, n, n equals 100. Uh, same uh, idea, it's uh, expected um, uh, additional badness out of sample, just about twice the number of parameters, and uh, although not exactly, and uh, AIC gets the rank ordering right, even though it misses by fractions of deviance on some of the cases. Yeah? Um, it, it sort of defies reasoning that it's that good and it's such a simple formula. So I kept saying AIC is of historical interest these days. There's no reason to use it because uh, it's a special case of something called the deviance information criterion. The deviance information criterion allows priors, but it also assumes a Gaussian posterior distribution. Yeah, and you'll see lots of software will spit out DIC, the deviance information criterion. Um, DIC itself is a special case of WAIC, the widely applicable information criterion, uh, which my software will spit out. <laughs> uh, and you'll be using it in this course. Um, and so uh, WAIC doesn't assume uh, a Gaussian uh, posterior distribution uh, even. Uh, it still has limitations. It's not an oracle. 
uh, it, it doesn't always work. Um, uh, none of these things always work and tell you the right answer. Uh, but um, using WA, if, if you can use AIC, you can use WAIC, right? And it, it, uh, then you can use priors, uh, which is a good idea. So just one slide about WAIC. There's a whole section in the chapter, chapter six of my book, where I give you uh, a lot of background on this. WAIC is structurally like AIC, but it uses the whole posterior distribution. So it's not calculating a single deviance. It's, it gets a whole distribution of deviances, right? Because predictions have distributions because parameters have distributions. So it does that whole thing. And um, this, uh, in this formula on the slide, 2PWAIC, uh, the PWAIC here is the effective number of parameters. It doesn't, it's not discrete. And sometimes it's a relationship to the actual parameter count is um, uh, small. <laughs> uh, and so, for example, um, I just finished up a project where the actual parameter count is about 27,000, uh, but the effective number of parameters is about 5,000. All right, you still think that's still a lot of parameters, yes. But, uh, but the differences can be really huge because parameters have different relationships to one another. In complex models, parameters don't have direct, not all parameters have direct relationships to prediction. They have to pass through other parameters to make predictions. And so the, the WAIC is designed to handle this sort of thing. Uh, but the expected overfitting risk comes from that term to PWAIC. Um, so yeah, this is uh, uh, what Tanabe called this the widely applicable information criterion. Um, it was first published in a set of papers, but now there's this whole book about it. Um, uh, but I've seen lots of people start to call it the uh, Watanabe Akaike information criterion. So these, you can see the community likes to name these things after the people who discover them, at least if they're Japanese, it does. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so I'm all for um, uh, naming it after the discoverers. Okay, so we finally reached the sunny beach at the end of this long, dark road of information theory to help you understand the um, concepts behind these things. And to repeat myself, uh, I give you all this background about the philosophy to, to demystify it. Uh, these things are not magical. They're simple attempts to estimate something that in principle cannot really be estimated except in the small world of the models. In the small world of the models, we can derive quantities like AIC or WAIC that give us the expected um, additional badness out of sample. And that's extremely useful for our judgments. But it doesn't guarantee that it's going to identify the right model in the real world, right? And that's something to keep in mind because there's nothing about the real world actually in the calculation. Yeah, uh, there never is. Uh, Real world is well, the, you know, we don't well, we don't want to go down that road of what, if whether anything is real, do we? Not in the morning. Okay. So um, let me try to summarize for you. Uh, underfitting uh, is also possible. Uh, uh, it's not usually the risk in science because people will add variables, right? Uh, uh, but it certainly is possible, and you should worry about it. Um, overfitting it seems to be inevitable. Even if you have structurally the right model, you need regular regularization of some kind to damp down the effect size estimates. Uh, so you want to use um, regularizing priors to reduce your overfitting, and you want to use information criterion at the same time to measure the overfitting risk of the different models. They, they are two great things that go well together. They're not alternatives. Uh, regularization addresses the problem of overfitting. Information criterion merely measure it. They don't do anything about it. Yeah? Does that make sense? Uh, oh yeah, the graph at the bottom here, this is the same graph as shown before, but now with WAIC uh, showing you its performance. Yeah? So I was wondering, how can we then think about time period kind of stuff? So here we have in sample and then out of sample, but if we were trying to predict mm. something. In a time series. Yeah, yeah time series are uh, one of these cases where you have to think really hard about it. Um, the usual risk is that if you take a time series model and you calculate WAIC on it, it will drastically under-represent your, your overfitting. Um, and the reason is because in a time series, it's really trivial to predict one point taken out of the middle of the time series. That's super simple. Predicting a whole new time series is a much harder problem. And so sometimes that's what people will do instead, is they'll try to do a cross-validation uh, exercise where you have to start with one observation and predict a whole sequence from there. You can't leave out, you have to leave out a whole sequence rather than one thing at a time. But the data set needs to be structured in a, in a way that that makes sense. Uh, but you, you want to think hard about that. This is a, a hard problem. And 
Uh, lots of people who study learning have worried about this, uh, and they'll often show both. Uh, what's the performance out of sample if we force it to predict the whole thing given just the start? Um, and as you can well imagine, there are different problems. Uh, yeah. Okay. So how do you use these things? Let's spend the rest of our time uh, with some examples of actual code. And uh, there's nothing challenging about the programming here because uh, we're just summing things up. But it's good to get some conceptual examples in your head. And I'm going to keep putting up pictures of athletes uh, finishing <laughs> so that you, uh, this metaphor keeps coming back to you that this isn't about choosing. It's about measuring the quantitative distances. Uh, everybody's a winner in these races. <laughs> Every model's a winner. Everybody gets a trophy. Uh, but some trophies are bigger than others. <laughs> and the quantitative differences in the size of those trophies is something that helps you place your bets on the next race. Uh, but in principle, any one of these athletes could win the next race. But the differences in their finishing time give you information that you want to retain and use. Right? It's not The next race is going to have more than one model in it, so uh, it's worth keep retaining all the information. So we're, we're going to avoid model selection. That is, we're, we don't want to choose one model as if it was the winner. Uh, there's lots of model uncertainty, and sometimes it really is a photo finish. You get multiple models that make very, very similar predictions to the data you have at hand. Uh, instead, we want to think about model comparison. We learn more by comparing the models and trying to understand why some of them have better predicted out-of-sample accuracy than the others. And the reasons matter, because our different reasons for fitting the models matter. So you need to inspect. You don't want to fall back on some heuristic that Oh, this model has the lowest AIC score, therefore it's right. No, that is not, that is not the thing to infer. And you'll see this, in, unfortunately, in high impact factor journals. Uh, but that is not what you want to do. Uh, you want to use the quantitative differences and try to understand why. And there are many reasons why a model could have the best predicted out of sample accuracy. And they're not always because it's the best model, meaning correct. Uh, it could be that you don't have a lot of data. And so the correct model can't be estimated properly you don't have enough data. That happens a lot of the time. Um, and then on the other end, if you have a lot of data, uh, I'll come back to this at the very end, I think. If you have a lot of data, the most complex model will nearly always win, uh, even if it's not correct. However, its predictions will be indistinguishable from the correct model, because you can train all the coefficients <laughs> if they're zero to be zero. Does this make sense? Uh, so this is the puzzling thing. It's, AIC does its job, and its job is not to tell you what's true. Its job is to tell you what performs best out of sample, and that depends upon lots of different things. Yeah? Okay. This sermon will keep reoccurring, and I hope you don't get bored of it. Um, so uh, the other thing we can do, from, aside from comparison, is model averaging. So you get a whole bunch of models. You uh, tried to estimate their relative out of sample performances, and if you've got a bunch of them that make useful predictions and those predictions are meaningfully different, you don't want to discard any of that. You can actually combine it into an ensemble of predictions. And this is an extremely common thing to do in real world applied statistics is not to use a single model, but to use a bunch. So this is how weather forecasting is done uh, through ensemble models, right? So those of you who keep up with climate science knows that climate science graphs are nearly always there's some ensemble model prediction because the details of how climate, how you model the Earth's climate are, the, the different models are really different radically in their, in their guts. Uh, and sometimes they make different predictions. So the ensemble of their predictions is what is often visualized. This is also how um, tropical storms are uh, predicted using ensemble models and so on. Uh, the important thing here, I'll give you an example of this at the very last thing today, but important thing to remember is we never average parameters. We only average predictions. Right. AIC and WAIC are measured on the prediction scale. That's what's judged against. You're looking at the accuracy of predictions. The parameters are little gears in the machine that generate predictions. And those gears are radically different in the different machines. You can compare the machines based upon the predictions, their behavior, but not based upon their guts. <laughs> right? You can't average their guts. So let's think of it this way. The average of the gear structure of the machines is not the same as the average of their behavior. Uh, it's, these are different things. And so it makes sense to average their behavior to make a prediction to, that's risk averse, but it doesn't make any sense to average their gear structure. You will not get a functional organism if you just average the guts of various species of animals, right? But if you average their behavior, you get something that's meaningful about how they behave in the aggregate. This metaphor kind of fell down, but does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I'll work on that one. Um, 
Okay. I, I, I go through that example because you'll see this mistake a lot in literature with model averaging is people averaging parameters. And there's a small set of simple models where you can do that and it, because the models are so simple and purely additive, you're also modeling predictions. But in general, it's not the right thing to do, right? Even if parameters have the same name in different models, they're still not the same thing. Uh, I know it's, it's horrible, but those are different worlds. Uh, different models are different small worlds. Uh, and the little Greek labels that you put on their machinery, that doesn't mean that they're the same thing. Um, it just doesn't. Okay, we'll have ex uh, lots of examples of this next week when we talk about interactions. So bear with me and it'll make some more sense as we go. All right, back to some data. Uh, these are the, the, the data that uh, my colleague Katie Hine kindly provided. Uh, we return to them. This is data on um, the brains and milk compositions of various primate species. Uh, and uh, we had looked before at the relationship between milk energy measured in kilocalories and two things we know about each species. It's log body mass and the percent of its brain mass that is neocortex. Um, and I'd used this uh, last week to illustrate this masking problem. Since, these, since body mass and um, neocortex are highly correlated with one another, you have need both in the model to see that they're both also related to the outcome. Uh, if you only have one in, then you drastically underestimate its relationship to the outcome variable. Is this, you remember this? Yeah, I remember it. Uh, uh, okay, so um, what we're gonna do now is fit four different models to these data, uh, the submodels implied by the, the model we looked at before. Um, and, and I'm gonna show these in this kind of formula design style that, that I think a lot of you are already familiar with, but if you're not, at the end of chapter five in the book, I explain this formula design style. It's extremely common in applied stats to explain linear models this way. So the first one, model 611, uh, that's what is called in the chapter where we fit it. Um, just as an intercept. That's what tilde one means. It's just a function of an intercept. Kilocalories is a function of some average. We're gonna estimate it. There's a parameter, call it alpha usually, and we're gonna estimate it, yeah? Uh, model 6.12, we're gonna model kilocalories in milk of each species as a function of an intercept, and the neocortex, the proportion of its brain that is neocortex. And 6.13, then we, it's the intercept plus log mass, and then 6.14 is the model we looked at last chapter, uh, which has both of them. This is the multiple regression, the one that reveals the masking relationship. So now what happens when we subject this uh, to the wilds of WAIC, where it tries to estimate this? And I wanna show you this example um, uh, so you get some sense of how it behaves. And remember, the cyclists at the bottom are to remind you, we're not trying to pick a winner, uh, we're trying to measure when they finish, uh, and the differences are important. And then we want to understand why, right? If one of these cyclists loses, we want to analyze the bicycle, figure out maybe it's the shoes, maybe it's what he ate for breakfast, whatever it is, we want to understand because you understand the winning model better when you understand why the other models perform as they do relative to it. And that's what the comparison is about. So we're not gonna discard, we're gonna use all the information. Okay, so what is the expected out of sample deviance for each model? Uh, there is uh, a utility function in the rethinking package just called compare. If you give it a list of fit models, it will compute WAIC for each and make this little table for you. Uh, uh, but I'm gonna walk you through in the next three slides, I think three or four slides, through the elements of this table, so don't panic. Uh, <laughs> you, you'll understand what's going on here. There's a lot of information though, and I'm very sympathetic to the idea that like, oh my God, that's the worst table I've ever seen. Yes, it is. And I'm struggling to find a better way to present these things. So if you have ideas, I'm definitely open to them. Um, thing to notice though is each row is a model and then each column is something we've computed about that model, which has to do not only with the model itself, but with the whole set. Uh, there, there are some of the columns are only features of the relative set of models. So let's walk through them real quick here. Um, the first column is WAIC. Uh, this is the estimate of the relative out of sample deviance. Notice these are negative values, which might bother you. Um, that's perfectly okay. I chose this example exactly because it produces negative ones. The rule is still true that smaller values are better. So smaller here means more negative. Uh, that's less bad. This is, a, this is a consequence of the way probability density works. The probability density, so 
some of you know because you've had a real course in probability theory probability density is the rate of change of cumulative probability and so it can be it can be negative uh, and all kinds of fun things can happen as a result of this so um, there's nothing wrong with getting negative uh, deviances uh, the rule is still true more negative is better and so the model on the top is the most negative it's the least bad it's still bad all these models are bad uh, but one of them is least bad, and that's the one that has both predictors. This doesn't surprise you, right? This is, I chose this example because it has the masking effect. Um, and then they get ranked down. Uh, the next in line is 6.11, uh, 6 then 6.13, and then 6.12 in the WAAC scores. The next column is this thing called the effective number of parameters. Uh, this is the estimate of the difference between in and out of sample. It's a measure of the, how flexible the model is, how trainable it is on any particular sample, in a sense. Uh, and uh, these are close to the actual numbers of parameters in each model, but not exactly the same. Uh, right, so uh, 6.11, for example, um, has two parameters, and 1.8 is close to two, I assert. <laughs> right, a not very scientific statement, but... Uh, well, it depends upon your domain whether 1.8 is close to 2 or not, right? Uh, horseshoes, hand grenades, right? all sorts of things. So, uh, uh, but what are the two? There's alpha and there's sigma. There's two parameters. Right? So there's two dimensions to fit. Um, 6.12 uh, uh, and 6.13 both have three parameters. It gets pretty close. Right? It's like magic. Right? This, this it still amazes me sometimes. It's like magic. It just counts parameters. There's nothing in the posterior distribution which tells it necessarily how many parameters there are, the way it does the calculation at least, and yet it counts them up in this vague sense. If you have strong priors, you will not get a parameter count like this, but the priors are weak here. Uh, and then in the last one, it's uh, uh, four actually. There's only four parameters, but uh, the estimate is higher. And there's a good reason for this, which I'll, I, I'll get to later if I have some time. Um, and then the DWA I see, this is the difference of each model from the best model. Remember, the best model is still bad, <laughs> but it's least bad. Uh, so the first one is zero, because the model is not different from itself. And then uh, you get the increments going down. Um, and then there's this thing called weight, which I'll explain uh, on a later slide. Um, so let's, let's jump to that now. So what is this weight column? These are sometimes called Akaike weights or model weights. They're a transformation of uh, the deviances, relative divergences, to a probability scale. Uh, so you're uh, dividing up uh, a crude weight of evidence in each um, on, the, on the deviant scale. So uh, the formula for this is in the book. You take a look. It's, it's very simple. It's basically you're undoing the log transformation on the deviant scale, putting it on the probability scale, and then constructing ratios. Um, and you can think of this so it, it's, heuristically, it's a probability, but it's not actually a probability of anything because we don't have a meta model that you're choosing models from, right? But uh, uh, this is, we use these things to do model averaging, which we'll do later. Uh, heuristically, you can use it to get an idea of how much of a slam dunk one model is over the other. So in this case, uh, 6.14 is outperforming the others by a lot. Um, however, this weight column is just using uh, the average and WAIC, one of its advantages over AIC is you get a distribution for it. You get a standard error. So you get error bars on it. And these, these metrics are typically highly uncertain. Uh, there are a lot of different values of WAIC consistent with any particular model and sample. And uh, so that's what these other last two columns are about. They give you estimates of the uncertainty in your information criterion <coughs> estimates. So SE is the standard error of the WAIC. Uh, and you'll see there are substantial fractions, right, of the differences between models. Yeah, so there's a lot of uncertainty. This is normal. It's very hard to say, especially with a sample size this small. And then the DSE, that's the difference in standard error of each model from the top-ranked model. So this refers back to the DWAIC column. Notice that the difference in standard error between the top-ranked and second-ranked model is uh, uh, bigger than the difference itself. The standard error of the difference is bigger than the difference itself. This is important is that the standard error of the difference is something different than the standard error of the estimate itself. Uh, I know that's confusing, sorry. This is, a, this is one of those times where English needs grammar, right? If I had some cases, I could say what referred to what here. But uh, bear with me, 
English has no grammar. So I'll try again and go slowly. So the standard error column is the standard error around WAIC, which means there's a distribution, an expected sampling distribution of WAIC. It's implied by the model. Uh, that gives us some idea of how uncertain we should be about that particular WAIC estimate. It's another thing when we compare two different models. Both of them have distributions for WAIC, and those distributions are correlated with one another. They're not uncorrelated. Because they're correlated, their difference is the distribution of their difference is different, sorry, this is one of those things given with the grammar, is not the same as, the distribution of their difference is not the same as the, distri <laughs> the, the difference in their distributions, right? So it's, it's, this is like computing contrasts in analysis of variance. The contrast effect is not the same as just looking at the overlap in the confidence intervals of two different things. It's a whole different distribution because uh, there's a bunch of estimates of the thing and you want to subtract the pairs of estimates and the distribution of those differences, of those paired differences is not the same as just the, the difference between the averages. Uh, I'm sorry, this is structurally complicated, but the picture at the bottom is going to explain this a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so looking at the bottom now, uh, if you can plot uh, the output from compare, if you just plot milk dot models here, you'll get this graph. And uh, this is a, a mild improvement over the table. Um, what we're looking at here is this, this, the black points are the in-sample fit of each model and the open points are the estimated out-of-sample fit of each model. Those are the WAIC values. Yeah. So the black points are in-sample Bayesian deviants. They're averaged. They're not example, exactly deviants because they're averaged over the whole posterior distribution. And then the open circles are the WAIC values. Then there are these bars that I've highlighted in orange here, which come from the standard error column. So they show you how uncertain uh, each individual AIC is. What you don't want to do is look at the overlap in these bars and decide whether any two models are different from one another. That is illogical. You should never do this. And by the way, that holds for every statistical comparison you've ever seen in a graph. You don't just look at the overlap in error bars. That is irrelevant to the question of whether the, model, the, the estimates are different from one another. Sorry, I'll, I'll say this over and over again because it's like in the you know, top five uh, statistical mistakes in the published literature of all times, right? Um, I think people are taught to do it someplace in a dark dungeon of bad stats. Uh, so, uh, so we need the differences. So the little triangles on here, which are supposed to be like delta for difference. Sorry, it's a crowded graph, but you can't make it 3D. Um, represent the differences of each subsequent model from the top one. So in the line in between the second model and the first, we've got the distribution of the difference between the two uh, centered on the other one. You can see that that standard error is, is big enough that it's, it's you know, uh, plausible. It's not likely, it's not the most likely thing, but it's plausible that actually model two is better out of sample in, in many cases. Um, does this make sense? Yeah, because it goes all the way to the zero line, yeah? Now the, the fact that it crosses the zero line doesn't mean they're the same, but it gives you an idea that the distributions overlap. A little bit, yeah. Um, and then from the other models, you'll see that uh, the differences uh, fade out in the same sense. Each difference is highly uncertain, um, and the worst models are a little bit worse yet. So back to horses. Again, uh, the goal here is that uh, we've got a whole set of horses that we put on the track, and they finished in a particular order. Some of them were really close to one another, like horse A and horse B here. And some were, were uh, uh, far behind the, the leading horses. But this was just this particular track, this particular sample on this particular day. And by knowing the differences in their finishing times uh, and retaining that information, we know more about the, uh, we learn more about the science of the underlying process of this. So it's, it's not about selection. Um, so now we, you, what you want to do is compare the estimates inside the models or compare their predictions so that you can understand why they're ranked the way they are. That's what I call the model comparison part. So let's do that with this. The, the action here in comparing this set of four models is to look at the, to see the masking effect. The reason model 6.14 does so much better, you know from last chapter, is because there's this standard problem that happens a lot in applied statistics where there are two predictors. They're both meaningfully associated with the outcome but they're also associated with one another. And their associations with the outcome are in opposite directions. So if you don't put both in the model, you can't, you underestimate the influence of either. 
that's the masking effect. So you can see that in this model comparison set. We look at the coefficients down here. So this is the graph you get from the coef tab function uh, in the rethinking package. Um, uh, we have clusters uh, clustered by parameter here, and then the models in different rows. You can see model uh, 6.13 and 6.11 don't have the beta coefficient for neocortex. That's what BN means. Um, and the models uh, 6.12 and 6.11 don't have the beta coefficient for log body mass. Uh, uh, but I want you to see, I'm going to talk about the log body mass issue and so it's so hard to see on the next slide. Um, but for BN now, just for the moment, you can see that the estimate increases dramatically in absolute value in the top ranked model. And that's the masking effect. The same thing's going on uh, for body mass. It's really hard to see on this graph, and the, the question is why. And the answer is because the predictors aren't standardized. They're on completely different scales. And so this graph puts them all on the same scale, and then you can't see the other one moving, right? It's just like so super tiny. So if you standardize the predictors ahead of time, what does that mean? Divide, divide them by their standard deviations, then you standardize them. Now they're all on the same scale. And once you do that, then you can put them all in the graph here and, um, and see the difference. Uh, the, the effect is at the top ranked model, it uh, uh, for the neocortex effect increases in absolute value, and so does the body mass effect, right? That's the masking thing. They're both increasing. That's the thing that happens. So the question would be, why is model 6.14 doing so much better? Uh, because when both predictors are in there, both of them are expected to be more strongly related to the outcome. Uh, so that's your clue that there's a masking effect. And then you're like, aha, there's a masking effect. And you write that in your paper and you've taught your colleagues something useful that you only get from the model comparison set, right? Not from just putting it in uh, by itself because you, you can't compare it to how the other, how the simpler models think of it. Um, okay. So model averaging, uh, uh, this is the last thing. Uh, we've got a set of models now. Um, they have different finishing times on the racetrack. Uh, when comp computing predictions, it'd be nice to average over the uncertainty in the models. Now, you've always been, uh, all the time in this course, when we plot predictions, we average over the uncertainty. The posterior distribution represents uncertainty in each parameter, in each unobserved variable inside the model. And when you compute predictions, those predictions are also uncertain because you're not sure about the parameter values. So we've spent a lot of time generating prediction envelopes that represent that uncertainty. Remember the shaded bow ties and all that stuff? Yeah? So we want to do the same for models now. Now we have uncertainty about models, and we'd like to retain and propagate that uncertainty on graphs. And this is the ensemble prediction uh, imperative. Um, uh, uh, if you have more than one model, you can average the average predictions of each model. That is, you can put them in a composite ensemble and put them up on graphs. And this makes meaningful differences sometimes because the ensemble predictions of uh, a set of models can look quite different from the average predictions of any one of the models in the set because it spreads the risk much more widely. The models can be structurally quite different. Uh, this is why climate people are into these because they have, it seems, irreconcilable differences about the structures of their models. They can't agree. And so uh, uh, they put all their predictions together. Uh, uh, so uh, again, I hit on this, do not average parameter estimates ever, 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 ever. Please, never. Angel loses their wings every time <laughs> you model, you, you average parameters. Um, averaging predictions is fine. And one way to, to remember this is that WAIC and all the other deviant score metrics are measured on the prediction space, not the parameter space. Parameters are used to make predictions, but they're not the thing that is actually being judged. It's the predictions that are the performance of the model. Okay, here's the, the procedure. There's more detail about this in the book. Um, you compute information criteria and weight for each model, compute the distribution of predictions for each model, uh, mix predictions using the model weights. Uh, I call this a prediction ensemble, which I think is the historically deepest term. It refers to a bunch of different procedures, including this one. Um, I've also seen people recently call this model stacking, which sounds kind of interesting, stacking them. Uh, you're stacking their predictions into a common set, and then we're going to represent them on graphs. Um, so uh, here's what it looks like for the milk uh, example, and I won't step through this code for you. This code's in the book. You can go through it. I just want to say that all that happens is uh, you fit the different models. Um, 
and then you feed them to this function called ensemble. Ensemble, uh, ensemble passes the model set to compare, gets the weights, it generates predictions for each by calling link, right, your friend link that you've been using in your homework, and then it mixes them in the right proportions and puts them on a graph. So I want you to see in the graph in the upper right is a comparison between the predictions of the top ranked model and the ensemble. Again, what we're going to look at here is the, the distinction between the predictions of the top ranked model, which is the model with both predictors, and the ensemble that uses all four. So even though the top ranked model is getting more than 90% of the model weight, uh, uh, the top ranked model is the narrow bow tie in the middle here. So the solid um, regression line in the middle is the map line from model 6.14. And then the narrow bow tie is the top model's prediction interval for the mean. You with me? Yeah? Uh, the dashed line that's very, very close to the map line is the map line for the ensemble. It's almost indistinguishable, almost exactly the same. But the, to the uncertainty is distributed very, very differently now. So now the shaded part on this graph is the, is the uncertainty of, around that mean for the ensemble. And you'll notice that it's biased in a particular direction, that is towards zero. The ensemble puts a lot of weight, uh, a, tail of, a long tail of weight on the idea that there's nothing going on here, uh, which is perhaps true, <laughs> right? It's, uh, it's always the risk with these things. And so if you only rescue the top model, you've undercalibrated your risk on this. So the, the ensemble predictions are, are an honest communication that isn't sweeping anything under the rug. Um, it's still, the map line still says, look, it, the most plausible thing is that there's a very strong relationship between these two variables. But there's this long tail of risk that there's nothing going on. And that's what we see in the shaded region, right? And the long tail, that matters. Uh, it really matters in decision making. Okay. So... Uh, let me stop here. Uh, this, is, this is just a weather prediction slide. I was going to come back to that. The long tail matters because when you're predicting storms, people die if you, don't, if you ignore the tail. Um, in the book, uh, there's a section about what I call the curse of Tippecanoe, which is the risk of if you try a whole bunch of models, eventually you will always find one that fits your sample really, really well. I encourage you to look at this section and sleep restlessly. Uh, um, okay. Uh, for your homework for this week to practice, do the first three hard problems at the end of chapter six. There are some even harder ones after those, and if you're feeling really good after these three, by all means, do the other ones. Uh, <laughs> right? So I, some of the, the faces I'm getting from the crowd are very entertaining. Uh, next week, we're going to do chapter seven on interactions, uh, and we'll do, have some more uh, practice with model comparison. So we're going to keep building up our tools in this course and using them each week. Uh, there's a holiday on Wednesday here in Germany. Uh, the international audience will not appreciate this. I think we, it's, it's bus and bed day, as I understand it, right? <laughs> it's a joke that only the natives will understand. Um, there will be no class, and so we'll only have one lecture next week on Friday, and we're in the traditional room upstairs in the heavens of this building uh, on Friday. Uh, week after next week, we're going to start Markov Chain Monte Carlo, which I am extremely excited to do, and I hope all of you are too. All right, thank you for your indulgence, and I'll see you next week.